Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Across the patients I saw in the clinic this week, a few stand up. I treated one woman with intense back pain who homeschools four young boys, all with some amount of developmental disability, who feels like she's at the end of her rope. I treated another young woman with shoulder problems that sears with pain every time she tries to lift bags of feed for the animals on her farm, who feels run down and inadequate. I saw a man with a problem with addiction, who's been jumping from physician to physician to get narcotic pain medication, who feels misunderstood and judged. And I saw a young athlete, injured during a game, who has months to go before he can return to competitive sports and will miss the rest of this year's season, who is anxious to be healed. And I saw an older man who served in the army and saw combat in Vietnam, now forced to live with his daughter because he cannot care for himself, who feels trapped and inadequate. Throughout the whole week, as I listened to the stories these patients shared, I heard these words of Jesus echo in the background. What are you looking for? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus begins his ministry with a sermon. In Mark, Jesus begins by silencing a demon. In Luke, Jesus quotes Isaiah, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. In each of these, Jesus acts. In words or in actions, Jesus points to himself as God's Son and Messiah. The Gospel writers wanted the reader to clearly, from the very beginning, understand who Jesus is and what kind of king or messiah or ruler he would be by highlighting his words and actions. But John takes a different track. For the first part of the Gospel, we have been alongside John the Baptist. First, we saw John in the wilderness preaching about the coming reign of God. We saw people from the whole countryside coming out to him to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Even Jesus, first seen in, the, in this gospel as an adult with no infant story, comes to be baptized by this Baptist. And as Jesus comes up from the water, the heavens are torn open, a dove descends, and God's voice declares Jesus as God's Son. So we do know who Jesus is. Like the other gospel writers, John has made clear exactly who this Jesus of Nazareth is. And the Baptist, after his baptism of Jesus, continues his ministry of preparing the way, never taking fame or fortune or credit for himself, but always pointing to Jesus. And as two of John's disciples, 
leave to follow John, to follow after the one that John declares the Lamb of God, Jesus begins his ministry with a question. What are you looking for? What are you seeking? What do you need? What deep down in your very being is missing? Because like all of you, or most of you, I could definitely use more money. I wouldn't turn down a new car that had more miles. I would take a magic wand to be healthier, skinnier, and certainly more hair. But that's not what Jesus is asking. And I think this has been a problem with the church. Too often we think of God as a genie. We pray for what we want and then we expect God will grant our requests. And when we, those things don't happen, the things we asked for don't come to be, sometimes we lose faith in God. And I suspect many have left the church for this reason. Jesus' question to those first two disciples and to us today runs much deeper than surface and material needs. What are you looking for? What deep down in your soul, in the hidden places that you don't let others see, is missing in your life? Does anger and frustration rule how you interact with people? Do you feel lost and without purpose at work or in your life? Do you feel afraid for what the future holds for you and your family? In so many places in our world and so many times in our lives, we're told that we're not good enough or smart enough or strong enough or good looking enough. So many times we're judged by a single decision we made rather than who we really are. So much of the time we're told that if only we had more money or more things or a smaller waistline, we would be better people. What are you looking for? It's a loaded question. First, it turns our gaze away from judging others and back onto ourselves and forces us to confront the demons in our own lives. And it drives us to Jesus. Because when we're honest about those hidden places in our souls, the only answer to what we need, to what we are looking for, is Christ. And sure, we can try to fill those needs with the things of this world. We can buy more things, we can build a bigger house, we can exercise more, and we can binge on food and alcohol, or try our luck even at gambling. We can choose to do those things and hope they give us some sense of fulfillment. But even before we start down that road, we know it's a dead end. The life-giving, transformative power of God is found in no other place than Jesus. Only through Christ do we see, receive forgiveness of sin. Only through Christ are we affirmed as children of God. Only through Christ is the brokenness in our relationships with each other and our planet mended. Only through Christ can we truly see all, that all those who are different from us are equally children of God, worthy of love and respect. Only through Christ are we able to live for the sake of others. Perhaps that's why when presented with this question from Jesus, those first two disciples' only answer is, where are you staying? And while Jesus takes them to a physical location where he's spending the night, their question too runs much deeper. What they are really asking about is where is the enduring, permanent, eternal, undying dwelling place of the Lamb of God? Where can we find the presence of God? Where can we find you, Jesus? Where will you be? On the dark days where our faith is tested, where can we find you? When relationships are breaking apart, where can we find you? When anger, depression, and fear start their stranglehold on our life, where can we find you? When I feel lost and alone, where can I find you? Come and see. If you want to know the Word made flesh, come and see Jesus. If you want to experience the fullness of life, come and see Jesus. If you want to feel the weight of all that burdens you lifted, come and see Jesus. If you need healing and forgiveness, come and see Jesus. If you desire to rest in the kingdom of God, come and see Jesus. The world will give you lots of ways to try and find fulfillment, but these do not have the power to give life. We spend so much time and energy chasing after the things of this world. Only God has the power to grant the fullness of life. And God stands right here in Jesus. Where Jesus is, there is forgiveness of sin. Where Jesus is, there is healing. Where Jesus is, there is fullness of life. Where Jesus is, there is God's kingdom. 
Where Jesus is, there is God. So then, what are you looking for?